Well, welcome everyone to episode five, season three of Hit It Where They Mow, Talking Golf in Texas. We have a very special show today. We have Sandra Haney here and also Paul Darwin. Uh, they're both Fort Worth natives. Uh, Sandra is in the World Golf Hall of Fame and the winner of 42 LPGA events for those majors. And uh, Paul is a former uh, national champion at Texas Wesleyan University and the University of Texas during the Ben Crenshaw, Tom Kite era. Before we dive into talking with our guest, I want to thank our sponsors so much. And uh, that is Veritex Bank, the Golf Bank of Texas, Malcolm Holland, Martin Thomas and Company. Uh, they're a wonderful bank for personal accounts and small commercial Counts. That's Veritex Bank. Google them and look at doing some business with the Golf Bank of Texas. And also Niagara Conservation. I like to say avoid the water hazards on the course and at home. Uh, they have the low flow plumbing uh, fixtures. And here's Tricia to tell you more about Niagara Conservation. Thanks, Pat. And thanks Niagara for your continuing support of nonprofit affordable housing projects. Are you looking for top quality bathroom fixtures that save water without compromising performance? We'll look no further than Niagara. With over 15 industry awards in just this past year, their toilets, bidets, and shower heads are the real deal. Plus, they come in various styles like ADA heights, elongated and round bowl shapes, and they utilize Niagara's patented stealth technology. And I want to thank our two golf courses that have sponsored all three seasons of uh, Hit It Where They Mow. And that is, I'll start this time with one near and dear to my heart, near Longview, Texas, the Tempest Golf Club, a Jeff Brower design. Uh, I like to say East Texas golf as it was meant to be, rolling hills, water, towering pine trees. The Tempest Golf Club outside of Longview, only two miles off I-20, tempestgolfclub.com to book your tee time a great stay and play location for you and your friends. And last but not least, um, my favorite golf course designer of all time, Mr. Perry Maxwell. Uh, Dornick Hills is only 90 minutes north of Dallas-Fort Worth, and that was his home farm where he built Dornick Hills. Of course, he went on to do Prairie Dunes in Hutchinson, Kansas, and many other great courses, including some renovative work at Augusta National. Thank you to Ar uh, Dornick Hills and Ardmore. Google them uh, to schedule a tour. They have great rates for non-resident memberships. And also you can take a foursome up there if you'll contact the golf shop. Without any more further ado, Sandra Haney, welcome to Hit It Where They Mow. Uh, it's great to have you on here. And Paul, welcome to you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about Growing up and learning golf in Texas, I know you're a native of Fort Worth, both of you are, right. and um, I know that at age 12 you moved to Austin, but you were mentioning, I was mentioning in your bio that uh, your dad, Jim Haney, was a golf pro, one that I knew at Royal Oaks right. uh, when I was at SMU in the, in the early 70s, and also A.G. Mitchell was a former pro at Rivercrest Country Club in Fort Worth, so kind of get us rolling by telling us a little bit about how you learned the game, and obviously it, it led to a great career in golf. Well, um, kind of the typical, you know, I went to the club with my dad, you know, type thing, and uh, we lived in uh, Midland at the time, and the pro, I was going to the pool, and the pro came out and said, have you ever tried it to hit a golf ball? And I went, no. And he said, would you like to? And I went, okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm an only child, so doing anything by myself appealed to me. Um, so he gave me a cutoff club, bucket of balls. He said, uh, watch me. He took a couple of swings and he said, copy that. He went back to the shop. I never saw him again. And I was still hitting balls when my dad came in uh, from playing. And so that was kind of my start. Uh, and uh, as I said, I, it was immediately uh, apparent that I didn't need anyone else for my success or failure at what I was doing. And that really appealed to me. So um, when I was 12, I uh, 
actually when I was 11, I met Mr. Mitchell at Rivercrest and was blessed to be able to work with him. He's really the architect of my game. And he uh, introduced me to uh, like the babe. I played nine holes with her when I was 12. And uh, <clears throat> so I was just, I had the a benefit of being in a wonderful uh, position to, to get to know a lot of great players. Wow. Uh, a little follow up on that for I want to bring Paul in, but a little, uh, you learn by copying, by imitation. Uh, and then you went at 11, you began to get some instruction. Do you recall what he tweaked or what he changed as far as your natural golf swing? Or was it just a, a emphasis on something or? Um, <clears throat> my natural golf swing was a quick hinge. Ah. And he said, I will never change that he said that's natural to you um, and that's the way he taught whatever was natural he just went with it uh, he always one of the biggest things he uh, uh, we worked on all the time was a grip to make sure I had a good grip and consequently I think I do mm -hmm. um, and other than that it was just uh, doing whatever is natural really uh, that's the way he taught um, and uh, just it was all basic fundamentals, nothing tricky. Of course, we didn't have track man and all that. I wouldn't, I don't like it today. I wouldn't have liked it then, um, but it was just foundation. Well, one more little follow up before we bring Paul in. Why would you not like the track man? Is it, does it, do you think it breeds uh, too much mechanical? Yes. Okay, I guess yeah, and, right. and for me, it's yeah. too much information. I, ah. I, I don't want that kind of information. I'm gonna play strictly from feel. Mm -hmm. So numbers and so I, it's not my deal. Um, my coach now certainly has all my videos and everything, but I have not. I don't watch them. Yeah, I know what my swing looks like, but <clears throat> I'm just I'm just not a technical person. So interesting you say that. Now we'll bring Paul in. I just met Paul in the last month, uh, and I want to give a shout out to Paul Leonard, uh, the great nephew of Marvin Leonard and the the grandson of his brother Obi. Uh, Leonard and uh, he introduced us and I think Paul took the video of my swing and then after I saw it I, I mentioned I might need counseling and and Paul you said no it's not that bad and, and uh, it reminded me that Bruce Liskey told me one time I don't want to see my swing I just want to right. keep hitting it the way I'm hitting it just say that as I told you that's what Sandra told me don't you don't want to unless you're hitting it really really well you don't want to video your swing because you will not like the way it looks so. right well I want to bring you in about your special friendship with Sandra and then and I want to thank you for allowing me to get to ask Sandra to come on the show because that was through you so tell us a little bit about your friendship with her well it's uh, we met through a mutual acquaintance 25, 30 years ago, I guess. And it was just one of those things where we just kind of hit it off. And she has become family to me. My mm -hmm. oldest daughter will call her Aunt Sandy. Okay. And uh, uh, I always wanted a big sister when I was a kid growing up. And a guy that lived down the street from me had a big sister. And I was, all, I was the oldest of three boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sandra's like that. She's my very best and dearest friend and uh, I love her to death and it's just something that developed over the years it just uh, from being uh, meeting each other through that mutual acquaintance yeah it's wonderful you know uh, I was mentioning George Mayshock earlier he's my trusty sidekick he's done a lot of shows with me and play at the University of Texas like you did he also says golf is the largest small fraternity in the world. Mm -hmm. If you play golf, I think it was Harvey Pennick said, if you play golf, you're my friend because we have this bond uh, that we love the game of golf. And uh, um, now you sent me a couple of articles, which I really enjoyed reading because I, I love to write about golf. And um, one of them was, a, was about uh, Ben Hogan, your friendship with him. I, I, maybe that's a bit much, but you had a relationship with Ben Hogan and we want to bring Sandra in on that in a minute, but tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> well, it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, interesting. Uh, my dad started me playing golf when I was eight. He yeah. took me to Colonial that first year in 59, and I didn't know who Ben Hogan was. And 
We're there on Sunday afternoon, and my dad says, they're giving Ben Hogan's group a 10-minute call, the first tee. Let's go follow him. He's from Fort Worth, and I always pull mm -hmm. for him because he's from Fort Worth. Well, I, again, I didn't know him from Adam. Who would know that seven years later I was taking a lesson from Martin Hall, who was a pro at Shady Oaks, mm -hmm. and at the end of the school year, my sophomore year in high school in 1966, he goes, what are you doing this summer? I said, I don't know, Art. I hadn't thought about it. He goes, you want a job? And he hired me to work at Shady Oaks. One of the guys who had worked there the summer before and became a good friend said, uh, he, he said, one of the perks of working here is from time to time we get to shake balls for Ben Hogan. And I was like, wow. wow. And so through that, over the three summers in my freshman year, because I worked out there on Mondays during my freshman year at Texas Wesleyan, I got to shag and caddy for him quite a bit, and it just kind of, not that we were friends, but right. he knew who I was, right. which to me, he was my hero in golf. Once I finally realized who he was, for him to know who I was was just extra special. So. Wow, that's, that's good. Yeah, both of y'all being from Fort Worth, I, I like to say Fort Worth is the premier golf town in Texas. I think San Antonio is a close second because the Texas Open and Brackenridge Park. But Colonial, Hogan and Nelson, both growing up at Glen Gardens, I mean, it's just, you, you couldn't make that stuff up. And, uh, um, and of course, today I was enlightened as to who A.G. Mitchell is uh, over at uh, uh, Rivercrest Country Club. And I have a friend that teaches there now, Doug Higgins Jr. Mm -hmm. You probably yep. know Doug and knew his dad and so forth. Now, I had the opportunity to talk to Wanda Hendricks just a while ago, and she said, let me tell you about Sandra Haney. If it wasn't for her, I don't know if I'd ever had a very good short game. <laughs> and she said that your short game was par excellence. Par excellence. And uh, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about your golf game. You won 42 LPG events. There's not many people on the planet that can say that. Four of them majors. Now, we do know that the late Kathy Whitworth won 88, but that's just crazy. Um, what Describe to us at your peak your golf game, because Wanda said you weren't necessarily very long. But, of course, when she knew you, you were still younger, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but tell us a little bit about your game and about the short game. And, and hopefully, I always get to this toward the end of the program, but things that might help the listener with their golf game as far as help, you know, getting better and that kind of thing? Well, I think that, uh, again, my, my strength was Mr. Mitchell. And uh, uh -huh. to um, really understand my golf game, okay. not your, understand. but understand okay. my golf game. Um, putting was my strength. I'm not sure that uh, the chipping uh, came along later in my career. When I was younger, I didn't pay much attention to it because um, I, I had hit a lot of greens and mm -hmm. I could putt mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> and a good short game chipping and around the grain wedge play and stuff came, as I said, came as I learned on, on the tour from, uh, I learned a short game from Paul Runyon. Um, Paul Runyon, wow. Mr. Mitchell had quit golf like in his 40s because he couldn't putt. And so he said, I will never ever tell you one thing about putting. And he didn't. Uh, so he said, go to the putting green and figure it out. And that's exactly what I did. And I never had a putting lesson um, because it was, it was my strength. Um, I didn't, like you said, I didn't hit it particularly long, but long enough. Okay. Um, so fairway woods and those kinds of things were uh, kind of a strength as well. Um, I think probably my strongest point was my mind more than my golf game. Wow. Um, I was able to um, uh, kind of be able to understand that when, no matter what I shot, that was the best I could do that day. And there has to be an understanding and an acceptance in whatever you're doing uh, that you give it your best every day. And that might be 65, it might be 75, who knows what it'll be. But as long as you can leave saying, I did my very best today, I'm okay with that. 
And so I would say that um, the mind part, um, and then later in my career, I, uh, through some friends in Japan, I learned about meditation, and um, I do that today. Um, and so that was just another added tool that I had to find peace. Let me not put words in your mouth, but let me see if I understand. I think this is, I don't know if profound is, that might be a bit much for a golf show, right. but um, I hear you saying that you weren't too hard on yourself, right? Uh, you know, it's or am, all, I, am I jumping to a conclusion no, there? It's, you know, it's a balance. Okay. I mean, sure. Uh, there's times that you you wonder what you know you, you hit a shot and you go what was that you know right. <laughs> uh, you know what what were you thinking about uh, but my tools were uh, things like was I really focused did I have mm. the correct information did mm -hmm. I you know did I process that information did I give myself time there's a lot of things that go into every golf shot mm -hmm. because every golf shot's different you're different your physical your mental changes instantly. Um, but I think that, um, again, acceptance of what you're doing, mm -hmm. I think, uh, sure, there were times I left the golf course not, not happy at all. Mm -hmm. But then you reflect and you go, um, okay, well, again, I did my best and, you know, I'll, uh, I, I remember one particular in uh, 82 at the Dinah Shore, I had shot like 74 on Saturday and not played well at all and made a couple of silly mistakes coming in. And I was so uh, upset with myself just because of a lack of performance. And so I just put it in perspective, I'll do better tomorrow. And I ended up shooting 65 the next day and lost by one, but it was okay because that was the very best I could do that day. Wow, that's neat. And, and I read your bio, and I, I want to say you played competitive, competitively until 89, is that right? Or, or, In the early 90s. Early yeah. 90s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your last win might have been 89? I don't uh, know. Last win was 82, I think. 82. Okay. I, I, I should have printed that out, but I didn't. So, uh, Paul, what are, you, what are your thoughts as you hear her? I mean, I... Uh, you know, profound may be a bit much, but I, 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 that's good stuff. I know Mike, um, gosh, I'm having a, a little bit of a brain freeze, but he's got a book out called the Tournament Play, Mike Booker? Yeah, Mike, Mike Booker. Booker. Mm -hmm. Tournament Player's Handbook. And he talks about, every time I see him now, I go, the process. In other words, think about the golf shot and not about what you're shooting, which I have a horrible time. I'm, I'm keeping a running tally all the time and and then I had a added thing to that. I went and played in a buddy tournament at Crown Colony. He told Bruce Devlin, what a great, still a great course there in Lufkin. In match play, you've got, well, if he makes par, and I'm, you know, you're always, I'm one up, you know. But your thoughts about what she just said, and have you had conversations with her about golf as such? Yeah, I, when I was a uh, senior in high school, I read, uh, Psycho Cybernetic yes. by Maxwell Maltz, which really put me in tune with how mental the game mm -hmm. really is. Mm -hmm. And she and I were having lunch one day, and I said, yeah, golf's 90% mental. And she goes, no, 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 it's 100% mental. And I thought, you know, you're exactly right. It is 100% mental. But I, I always enjoy playing with her because if, if I hit a shot, I don't hit it very well. I'm like, God, I caught that on the toe. Or I, and she goes, no, no, uh, critiquing, no, no critiquing <laughs> is the way she terms it. And, uh, I, I, but I've just, I'm always been amazed at just how mental, mental she is on mm -hmm. the golf course. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, uh, I've never played with anyone that's, uh, at, 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 as much as she is. And, when, when we play, I always would hope be? some of that would rub <laughs> off on me, even though I know because of Maxwell Maltz's book how much mental it is. But uh, I've just I've always been amazed at, at just how good she is at that. You know, I read that book and I went out. It was a qualifying round, the Briarwood Invitational. Shot 33 on the front, 
and got rained out. So <laughs> malls didn't have anything on that. Yeah, right. So it didn't count. Out. But but yeah, I remember high school. That was he was a plastic surgeon. Right. He talked about self-image and, yeah, and being good to yourself. Right. And what amazed him being a plastic surgeon was that even though he would change people's appearance, it didn't change right. the way they felt about That's each right. other, that it was all, That's right. all up here. That's right. Um, I did notice, I wanted to talk a little bit about Kathy Whitworth because uh, I got to have her on my radio show a couple of times. She's one of the most, she was, when, a matter of fact, a friend called and wasn't aware she had passed away. It's been within the last year. It hasn't uh, been it was Christmas. Christmas, yeah, less than a year. Um, but I don't recall ever meeting a nicer, more humble person than her. And um, I mentioned to you before that um, the Volunteers of America tournament that's out at the colony. I think it's called the Ascendant Championship, benefiting the Volunteers of America. Probably the longest title yeah. of any golf tournament. <laughs> Um, they're doing a lot to honor her now with a Kathy Whitworth dinner. They already had the Kathy Whitworth trophy. Um, but Mike King, uh, the CEO, I, I was always after him to do more to honor her because she's the winningest golfer of all time, men or women. Um, and um, I found out later that she didn't want that. It was embarrassing to her. And um, I think you bought, again, I should have printed out the notes, I want to say you beat her in two or three, maybe four, sudden death playoffs. I think we played, I think it was like six playoffs. Wow. Something like that. And I won the majority of them. Yeah. Well, one of the little funnies was when I was talking to her, I said, you know, Kathy, you had 88 wins, but you lost 12 playoffs. You could have had a hundred, a hundred <laughs> wins. She goes, why did you have to bring that up? <laughs> right. She was just a sweetheart. Uh, yeah, and and, uh, and and of course, Kathy would always say, I think Mickey Wright was the greatest women's player of all time. And Mickey would always say Kathy was, because Kathy won more. But really, I mean, everyone says Mickey Wright has the, the greatest golf swing they've ever Absolutely. seen. Absolutely. So, Tell us a little bit about your experiences with those two women golfers who were so good. Well, I was very fortunate uh, through, again, through Mr. Mitchell to have played in a few professional events as an amateur when I was growing up and, and was fortunate enough to get to know Mickey and Bessie Rawls and <clears throat> those players. And um, actually with Mickey, um, the second year on tour, for me, I we were playing at the old Austin Country Club <clears throat> and uh, the last round and I was playing with Mickey and I won the tournament. So that was the way I won my first ah. first tournament is with Mickey right there. Um, yeah, greatest golf swing. Um, I think we all uh, were sorry that she chose to retire as early mm -hmm. as she did, mm -hmm. um, but that certainly her choice, but uh, we missed having her presence out there. and. <clears throat> um, such a uh, such a competitor, but at the same time a very gentle soul. Just mm -hmm. really, really and, kind. And very tall. Very right? tall. Yeah. Six foot. Yep. Uh, yeah. Almost, not quite. Not, not quite. Okay. And uh, actually, we started. Um, she came to me early on because we kind of knew each other, and she said, "We're going to start a contest." I went, oh, this is not <laughs> going to be good for me. Um, <laughs> She said, we're going to uh, keep total putts every day, and it'll be for dinner. Okay, putting, I think I can, because putting was really important to her. And so we kept them, and I don't think all year long we would trade it, maybe one dinner, maybe. And, but the thing that happened was that it made me really understand the importance of every putt every stroke, pay mm. attention, mm. you know, so we were pretty consistently, you know, in the 26, 27, 28 range always. So uh, that was a valuable lesson to learn. And thanks to her, she allowed me to do that. And we did it for years. <clears throat> and, you know, with Kathy, um, we had a, we done, we had done a lot of appearances together through the years. And uh, we had 
kind of a, we'd wait to see who was going to tell the story first. Okay. But um, I three putted the last hole in Baltimore for her to win her very first tournament. Really? Yes. First one of 88? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, she owes you one of that. <laughs> Fascinating about the putting, you know, made me think of, and I, I, I kind of want to delve into this a little bit too. Uh, one of Harvey Pinnock's little thing was go to dinner with good putters because mm -hmm. they're usually more positive thinking people, maybe. I, and you kind of did that with her. If y'all are having these dinner oh, yeah. bets, yeah. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. She thought putting was that important to to really pay attention to it. And as I said, you know, sometimes if things aren't going well, you kind of, you might be inclined to jump over a putt and, oh, well. But when you've got, you know, you're playing <laughs> against Mickey Wright, no, you don't do that. <laughs> Pay attention. That's good. Well, let, let, let's tee up Harvey Pinnock a bit. You know, that the title of my show, Hit It Where They Mow, and You'll Enjoy Golf a Lot More. I don't even know if it's truly a Harvey Pinnock saying, but it was given to me as a Harvey Pinnock saying. And I've read the Little Red Book, and I've read several of the follow-ups to it, so it might be in there somewhere. But Wanda Hendricks was telling me that one of the things you helped her with, uh, or maybe it was your dad, someone said, you need to go see Harvey Pinnock. And that started her relationship with him. And, of course, she was a tremendous advocate of him you know mm -hmm. when i when i knew her she had a little book of all his sayings and so forth before the little red book wanda had her own little clip book but uh, uh were you associated with harvey some or did you know him well or? i i'm not gonna say i knew him well uh -huh. but i will i always say that he was i was very lucky to have him in my life because mm -hmm. my all my junior golf was in austin okay and so um, <clears throat> when I, I don't know, maybe 12 or 13, my, we were in Austin and my dad took me to see Harvey and <clears throat> Harvey watched me hit a couple and he asked me, he said, <clears throat> who, who do you work with? And I said, Mr. Mitchell. And he said, well, you're with the best. And he turned around and walked to the pro shop. <laughs> <laughs> so I never worked with Mr. Pinnock, but mm -hmm. as I said, I felt fortunate to have him in my life because we did share some conversations. And um, but those, you know, those of us that grew up in that area. You know. That's so funny you mentioned that because I, I can't help myself. It reminded me of a story that Mr. Triggs told me. I don't know if you knew, remember AJ Triggs, but he was an amateur there from Tyler and. Jimmy McGonagall was a really good player. I think he was from uh, Shreveport. And they were playing at Texarkana Country Club. And Jimmy beat him in a match. And as they're walking in from the 14th hole or whatever, he said, do you mind if I give you a pointer? And Mr. Trix says no. And so he told him something. And when he got back to North Texas, he asked Byron Nelson. He said, Jimmy McGonagall told me this. And, and that's what Byron Nelson said. He said, if he told you that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> use it. <laughs> But uh, uh, what, what about you, Paul, and, and Harvey Penning? I know he was still in his dominion when you were at the University of Texas. And yeah, and I never took a lesson from him. Mm -hmm. uh, I did, uh, when Tom would take a lesson from him, I'd go just see if there was something I could glean. And listen? Yeah, just, yeah. just sit there and, and listen, but uh, I never, never took a lesson from him. So I did ask him after Tom took a lesson one day, I said, what did you tell Ben? And he goes, I didn't tell Ben anything. I just <laughs> handed him a club and said, son, go play, because he was such a natural athlete. Yeah, I told you that um, at Don January's funeral, or it was more really, they had a reception at Prestonwood Country Club. Don wanted an open bar and a Mexican food buffet. And, <laughs> And Ben spoke, and Ben said that Don January he thought was the most natural golfer he'd ever played with. And somebody said, coming from Ben, that's quite a comment or compliment because Ben was very natural. He just played right. golf. Right. 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 Yeah, Ben uh, was playing tennis and hurt his back. And uh, doctor said, don't touch a club or hit a golf ball for three or four weeks. So all he could do is putt. So the very first day he was able to get out and play, 
Ben and myself and one or two other guys on the team, we went and played Muni. Now, again, Muni's not a difficult golf course, but you still got to hit some sure. shots. He goes, I hadn't touched the club in a month, and he shot 69. Yeah. So it just, just shows you how natural he was. Now, before we leave Austin, uh, again, I know I'm redundant in some things, but I, lo- I love uh, uh, Mr. Mayshock. As I say, he may shock you because uh, he's quite a character. But he's written a song. And uh, he, he wrote it for Saving Muni, um, and they haven't used it. But uh, part of it, of it, his lyrics is, put on your tennis shoes and get on your bicycle and pedal down to Muni. <laughs> and when I told Paul Darwin that, uh, Sandra, he said that, oh, that's perfect for Sandra. She used to ride her bicycle down to Balconies Correct. when your dad was building it. So, Well, I used to, we... When we first moved to Austin, we lived across the street from Muni. Oh, really? Yeah. And I went to o. Henry Junior High, which was right there. And so, uh-huh. yeah, the guys that I played with on the golf team, we'd get on our bikes after school and <laughs> ride over to Muni, and uh, we'd play till dark. Yeah, I think that's that's great about you know put on your tennis shoes and pedal over to Muni because yep. uh, you know they're wanting more you know to make it more available for more kids and make it fun and and, uh, and, that, and that leads me to uh just your thoughts about the game today i know there's so much money now but uh things like the first tee and so forth what are what are your thoughts about where the game is and is it better now or is it need, does it need to improve more or just kind of your thoughts on that well i think that um certainly uh We've always, through history, we've always had great players. Mm -hmm. We just happen to have more of them right now. And I think international, you know, has has brought, you know, a lot of interest through all the different countries. And so we have that. And uh, what what they have, the programs for the for the kids, very, very important. First Mm -hmm. tee and then all the AJGA Mm -hmm. tournaments that they Mm -hmm. the kids have. Uh, very important for the growth of the game. And, um, you know, the expanse of just tournaments for for amateurs, for seniors, it's very diverse now, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is only good for the game. Right. Um, unfortunately, COVID was probably the best thing that ever happened to the that, game. That, it, it, golf yeah. kind of took off right. again. It did, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm... I don't know the stats of how many we've kept since then, but mm-hmm. I think a, a large majority. Um, but I think the, the game is fairly healthy. I think there's some struggles mm-hmm. with Live Golf, mm-hmm. um, and I think that that hasn't played out yet. I don't know. We, we don't know where that's going to end up. Um, I think there's some uh, confusion as to who can play where now yeah and so they're gonna have to sort that out yeah but um other than that i think uh golf is in a good place and 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 while you're talking about that uh the earlier comments about not being so beholden to track man like for instance uh swanee's golf down in houston i love that little place my friend bill pelham when i go visit bill we go over there and we eat lunch and they had this old par three course that they use for uh, a practice range. And the last time I went down there, it was about a tenth of it. They had taken all that range and quit keeping it up and they put some nets up and they had a bunch of mats. And they said, the kids don't care where it goes. They just want to, <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> they they want to hit it and look at their phone and see how hard they hit it. And what, ha- I mean, just it's inconceivable for me, but it, how, how do you uh, you say you just play by feel and you teach yep. feel and, and I, I do uh-huh. and um, I teach very very old school um, but um, on the other side I know right now the majority is being taught the kids are being taught swing hard we'll see how far you hit it and we'll figure out straight later <laughs> and I'm you know okay is it working I don't know time will tell Right. Okay. So this is very selfish, but I have a friend and she's very athletic. Uh, I say that she hikes and so forth. And and she's, uh, I won't give her age away, but she's not a teenager anymore, but she didn't learn how to play golf when she was younger. And I talked to Wanda a little bit about this, Wanda Hendricks. 
How difficult is it for an adult to learn to swing the golf club when they didn't learn, when they didn't imitate somebody when they were a kid? There's a term for that. I'm not smart enough to remember what it is. But when you're a kid, you can imitate very easily. Mm -hmm. And as you get older, we, we restrict ourselves or we, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, when you drink, you, oh, you inhibit yourself. Uh, does, does that make any sense to you? Well, as you get older, you think you have a brain and that you can use it. Uh -uh. <laughs> and unfortunately, in the game of golf, I think that needs to <clears throat> um, find a way to organize itself. Um, I absolutely believe that she can find a way to, to learn the game, learn the basics. Um, you know, it's not maybe where it would be years ago, mm -hmm. but I think you can always reach a level of enjoyment. Um, I do some <clears throat> um, beginner classes for the Texas Golf Association, and we've had a little bit of success, and they've seemed to enjoy it. And um, what we do is we start with putting because a beginner doesn't even know what contact with a putter feels like. So we start, we start with that. We go to chipping, okay, that's nothing but a, a large putt stroke, and we end up on the range, and we use the same stroke that we use chipping, it only it just gets a little bit bigger, and we let the swing grow naturally, and it seems to be working. I like that, I like that, yeah, that's, uh, begin, begin with contact. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and feel where it is. I was gonna say, uh, uh, I, I usually bring this up every show, but, I talk about the the compelling nature of golf or the uh, allure of it. And in my opinion, these are the four things you can add to it or subtract from it. But one, the friendships you make, the people you get to know. Two, the beautiful places you get to play. You're outdoors. It's beautiful. It's nature. Three, there is a competitive element. And, and ultimately, it's you against what you think you can do. Um, and then the, the one thing that I learned even before first tee when I was volunteering with kids was the flight of the ball. And I think about myself, the thing that attracted me to golf was, oh my, that ball went where I was wanting to hit it and it went real high in the air and it went a long way. It's almost intoxicating. Um, and so when a beginner comes to you as an adult, it's hard for them to see that flight of the ball until they... Mm -hmm. learn a few fundamentals to mm -hmm. be able to do that. Would you agree to that uh, philosophy or that that uh, in, uh, recipe for why golf is oh, fun? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. You know, um, you know, I say that, you know, um, anybody, um, especially in corporate world, mm -hmm. you know, if you just have an understanding of the game, and you walk into a CEO's office and you see a club leaning against the wall or a little trophy, you instantly have something in common with that right. person. You instantly can start talking about the game, whether you're a good player or not, mm -hmm. just understand the lingo. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, so it's, it's absolutely about relationships, mm -hmm. um, whether that be with other people or yourself. Right. You learn about yourself on the golf course a lot. And uh, how, how are you going to manage the goods and the bads? Well, I, had a, I finally had a good round the other day. But before it happened, uh, I messed up a few holes and I was making excuses. I'm easily distracted and people are always distracting me. And, and I had to kind of like get over it. And I think that helped me play better on the back nine because I took ownership of it. Um, and that's what Mike Booker teaches. You know, mm -hmm. good golfers yeah. are not victims. You know, they they, they process it. What well, you want to jump in here, Paul? How about all this philosophical talk about <laughs> golf? <laughs> well, I, what always first off when I went in uh, again, my dad started me playing when I was eight. Yeah. And when I went in the seventh grade junior high school, I wasn't quite five feet tall and I weighed about eighty-five pounds, so I was too little to play football, too little to play basketball, and I could run the 100-yard dash in about 13.2 seconds. So uh, I lived across the street from Meadowbrook Golf Course on the east side of Fort Worth, mm -hmm. and uh, they were redoing the golf course that year, 
but they had already got the grass planted out and I lived across the street from 11 <laughs> tea box and I would go out and where 10 green was, I'd hit balls from behind the green up on the hill and then I'd hit them back to the green and back and forth. And what I liked, it, what Sandra said earlier, it's, it's by yourself. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's you. And also, I like the competitive element, but it wasn't so much me playing someone else. It was how bad could I beat the golf course? Mm -hmm. And you're always trying to beat the mm -hmm. golf course more and more each time you play. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, to hit a good shot, it's, yeah, it's a great feeling, and you like to see the flight of it. But I enjoyed it. It was something I could do by myself, and... It was me against the golf course. I didn't need anybody else to play against. Yeah, I love that. And I, I remember even early in my business career, one of my old girlfriends got a kick out of this, is that after work, I'd go play nine holes somewhere, Marlin or whatever little town, and it would be me and Jack Nicholas. And I'd always give Jack the honor. You know, so I'd play two balls around. I'd always beat him by one shot. It was amazing. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to tell you a little live story that I haven't told you yet. Uh, so I'm hitting, um, this is a free advertisement for uh, the, the Bef Golf Performance Center at the Highlands, the Highlands Golf Performance Center, which is the old Golden Bear uh, golf range off of Trinity Mills there in Dallas. And I'd hit a bucket of balls and I was talking to my friend on the patio. And as we're leaving, I walked into the foyer and there's a guy walking, carrying a huge bag, walking along with a big, beautiful white German Shepherd. I said, and actually I was looking at the dog, even though I'm, you know, I don't want to get bit by a German <laughs> Shepherd, but friendly, friendly dog. And uh, I said, oh, that's a beautiful dog. And he's getting closer. And I said, ah, oh, you got the Crusher symbol, or the logo on your shirt. And about that time he stops and looks at me and it was Bryson DeChambeau. <laughs> and it, I said, Bryson. And he says, yeah, and he and <coughs> shook my hand. And I realize now why he uses those big grips. He has huge hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, yeah, he, he said, he's a good dog, but he likes to get golf balls and, and take them away. And uh, I congratulate him on his year. He's had a good year. And this is personal, but I said, you know, you remind me of Payne Stewart. I went to SMU and you remind me of Payne Stewart. And he said, well, thank you very much. That's, that's a great compliment. And uh, I thought later I was gonna ask him, is that money real that you're getting? <laughs> or is it monopoly money or what, you know, what, what is that? But uh, what a surprise that was. And as I was driving back to my condo, I thought, I don't know this, but I thought, you know, it's, it's obviously a very good place to hit balls, but they were allowing him to take his dog out there with him while he hit balls. I don't know that you could do that at a lot of clubs. Right. Shady Oaks probably wouldn't like it. Uh, <laughs> Dallas National might, I don't know that, but I, I, would, I would surmise that. Um, I wanted to, to transition a little bit about the Hall of Fame event the other night and Lee Trevino, and I wanna, I've got a motive for going here, but just first of all, your thoughts about being there with all your fellow, you're in the Texas Golf Hall of Fame and the World Golf Hall of Fame, and deservedly so, and that has to be quite an honor to you, but just your thoughts of the other night about Texas golf and that evening, it was pretty special. Oh, it absolutely was. Uh, it was it was wonderful to see everybody, and I thought it was really, really well done. And uh, <clears throat> Ali Ger Gerard, our director now of the Texas Golf Hall of Fame, she did a terrific job. Yes. And uh, it was, uh, I'm sure that was quite a task to get that many people there. Um, it it and went off so seamlessly. It really though. did. Yeah. It was really nice, and to be able to see that wall that, you mm -hmm. know, We've done our interviews and everything, and to actually see it, uh, and uh, that's uh, that was my first time up in that direction, and it was, uh, it was special. Paul, you got to go see it. it. It literally is a mile long from the Omni Hotel down to where the North Texas PGA building is, which is on one end, the Omni's on the other, and all that's in between. It feels like a mile. It may not be that far, but um, they have a a dance floor with a big putting green with some restaurants and business around. They have a little 10 hole short course. Um, and then they have the, the, but the way they did it with the food station and mm -hmm. just going and getting your food and sitting, it was just, uh, it was a great evening. Um, but that leads me into what, this is selfish again, but 
Trevino going on about the bounce of the wedge, and that is something I have never, I've only been playing 60 years, but I've never quite understood what people talk about with the bounce. So I asked Jackie Cupid about it, and I asked um, Caitlin Seppery, who teaches over at Willowbrook where I play, and basically the bounce is the bottom or the backside of the flange of the wedge, right? Correct. Do you, in your short game expertise, do you ever think of using the bounce? Is that ever in your mind? No. No. You just no. hit the ball. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, growing up in Texas, if you've got a lot of bounce on your wedge, you're going to be sculling a lot of golf balls mm -hmm. because the ground's pretty hard, usually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. usually, uh, during the summer. So, no, I mean, I've had the same degree wedges in my bag forever. Just standard, like yeah. 12 or 14 bounce, something like that? Yeah. You know, they're putting the bounce on the clubs now. Like right, that. right. I just bought a new one, 14. Your, any thoughts you have on that bounce? Well, it's uh, uh, interesting. When I was working at Shady Oaks, uh, got my set of Hogan irons uh, from Art Hall there in the shop, and I got a sand iron, and I wanted to be able to hit it off the fairway, mm -hmm. but because of the bounce, uh, it made it difficult, and Tom Sislak, who was an assistant pro, we had a grinder there in the back room, <laughs> and he ground the heel way down and said, now, you." and I've still got that wedge in them, and I could, I could hit it off hard pans, I could hit it off the firm turf, I could hit it off anything. So, I, like Sandra, I'm not big on a, a lot of bounce on a golf club. Well, what, this is, again, at the range, so it may not, hold up that I don't want to be too negative about it but I know I remember Trevino said about hitting a wedge you have to get the club in the dirt I don't know if you've ever heard that comment before yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, I think I've always tried to be I always have a little anxiety about hitting a pitch shot or a wedge shot and I try to be perfect with it and I think what I found is if I just okay, I'm gonna let the club get into the dirt with the bounce. There's a little more room for error. You may chunk it a little bit, but it just seems like it makes it a little easier. But maybe I'm overthinking that. I don't know. Um, I, I think maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe just a little. Bit. Uh, first of all, there's no perfect in golf. Beautiful. None. Just you know, if you're looking for perfect, I I don't know where you find that. Certainly not in the game of golf. Um, I, I think, you know, again, if you're playing on hard ground, uh, bounce is going to be an enemy. Okay. Um, so it's going to be a little less. But I, yeah, as I said, I don't know that I really ever paid that much attention. <laughs> but um, it's something for Lee to discuss. Well, exactly. Uh, 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 so it's what his he, opinion. Yeah, I wrote a good article about him. They haven't published it in the Tyler paper. I'm trying to figure out a way to start putting my articles on Facebook. So people, but I said he said that he could have eight degrees of bounce. It wouldn't matter because he got so far in front of it. But he says if you're a flipper, which I've been called a flipper, which really bothered me until I heard that Julie Boris was known. It's kind mm -hmm. of flipping the, his hands and. You may want 16 degrees. Well, that kind of went over my head, but I got to thinking about it. But you're right. I'm probably over. <laughs> just maybe a little. I, I like your thing. Turn the brain off, right? Yeah. Turn it off. Well, yeah. just get it organized. Get it organized. That's yeah. right. Okay. I mean, you know, and that's, to me, that's what a pre-shot routine does is it organizes your mind to the target. I think you just gave me the title for this show. Get yeah. it organized. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What have I forgotten to ask today? I was trying to look at my notes again. I, well, excuse me. <laughs> I know I'm bad, but you have to share the Hogan story about you when you won the Fort Worth Junior. I mean, it's just too good. I want, and then we'll come back to what I forgot to ask. Well, I, we have a little bit of time here. Well, well uh, again, <laughs> um, getting the shag. I, I caddied for him three times. A lot, a lot of guys never got to caddy for right. him out there. They shagged balls, but I did get to caddy for him three times. And I'd won the four C Junior in 1967, and Wendell Condit, who I talked to you about mm -hmm. before, who ran the C Junior for 50 years, 
He had me go down. They made my picture for the St Sunday Star Telegram before the tournament 68. So they had all this stuff about I was defending champion. And we played the second round that year, just like we did the previous year in 67 at Shady Oaks. And uh, they said I had a three shot lead, blah, blah, blah. We played Glenn Garden in the third round. And so I went out that afternoon, that Wednesday afternoon, to Shady Oaks to see art about something. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember now what. And Mr. Hogan hated punting on the putting green. So <laughs> Mr. Leonard had put two greens about 45 yards long. It's a long, long green right outside the pro shop door. He put two cups on the back of two green. And when Mr. Hogan hit balls, he'd go in, sign a ticket for whoever shagged balls for him, get three balls of his putter, and he would putt, practice his putt on the back of two green. So now the clubhouse is burned, so it's all different, but you used to be able to see all the way the parking lot back then. And I went up this little ramp and turned to go in the pro shop, and he had just finished hitting balls and signed the ticket, and he was headed out to two green to putt. We got about as close as we are. And I said, hello, Mr. Hogan. And he stops me and goes, how big a lead you got now? And I thought, wow, he's following me in the newspaper. <laughs> so uh, I said seven strokes, and he goes, where do you play tomorrow? And I said, Diamond Oaks. And he goes, well, you'd be able to kick it around out there and win. <laughs> and I said, well, I hope so, Mr. Hogan. And he goes, never will free. He said, don't worry, you got this tournament in the bag. And I said, well, thank you, Mr. Hogan. I really appreciate that. And he says again, don't worry, you got this tournament in the bag. I said, thanks, Mr. Hogan. I appreciate it. He nodded and turned around to walk over to Two Green to practice his putting. So the next morning, I get up on one tee and I hook it in the trees to the left on one at Diamond Oaks, chip it out in the fairway, knock it on about 20 feet, trying to make the putt for par, a three putt and make double bogey. And I can hear in my <laughs> head, you can kick it around out there. Right, right. So, And you're also thinking, if I lose this, I can't go back to I, Shady Oaks. I can never go to Shady Oaks again, you're right. So uh, anyway, uh, fortunately the guy who was in second made bogey, so I still had a six-stroke lead. Anyway, I played the next 12 or 13 holes, one under, and I ended up winning by 11 strokes. There you go. So, so it all worked out, so I could go back and face him again. So, um, But after that first hole, it was a little, and, 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 and it'll, it'll stress your mind at that point, <laughs> that's for sure. But as they say, priceless. Yes. Um, and I, it's not to disparage uh, Diamond Oaks. Good no, golf course. No, not, Diamond Oaks is a great golf course. Not, not ex to me, it was kind of a shorter version of Royal Oaks when your dad worked out there. Mm -hmm. When they first opened Royal Oaks, it was just mm -hmm. tight as it could be. Now they don't have as many, it still may be tight, but they don't have as many trees as they, uh, right. as they once had. You know, I meant to ask you earlier, you said you weren't long, but you were long enough. And now that I'm a senior golfer, and there's all this talk about, well, where should we play? Like from 5,800 yards or 6,200 yards. What would you say the average length on the LPJ was in, during your prime? Was it 6,200 yards, 64, 59, you know? Uh, probably more like at least 62. We've, okay. we've played them fairly long. I mean, yeah. yeah. You said we, you hit a lot of four woods, yeah, right? Yeah, hit a lot of fairway <laughs> woods. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I remember playing some even longer than that, you know, because at that time there probably weren't a lot of forward tees. So, can, you yeah. know, the. Th that's um, a later development. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, so it, now you're able to kind of find where where is your level? And mm -hmm. I just really do encourage people. I know people go, well, you know, gosh, I really hate to move on up, but. It measure the enjoyment that you're going to have from being able to hit some irons and some woods and just mix it up a little bit. Not, yeah. If you play it too long, you're just going to be exhausted and it's just not worth it. You know, I got to go play Corpus Christi Country Club. I got to be my age. I had never been to Corpus Christi. And I thought I had a chance to go. They were, Chet Williams had redone it and they were having a media day. And I've always liked this, but they had, for every set of tees, they had a blended. In other words, you could play the black and then the blue, or you could play a blend, or you could play the blue or the white, or you could play a blend. And uh, I think that's what you're mm -hmm. saying. Find find the, the, the comfort there, right. the distance. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, what am I forgetting to ask, Paul? You and I have 
talked about this. Don't look at your golf swing. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, I know what I want to ask you. Okay. Okay. And I'm so looking forward to seeing what the new Colonial looks like. But you got one round of golf to play. I know this is cliche, but where would you want to play that round of golf? If I have one round of golf yes. to play, probably the my first choice, <coughs> excuse me, be the Masters Golf Club. Um, and my second choice, believe it or not, would be the Country Club up in Brookline. That's good. Where the I played up there in the USGA Junior in '68, mm -hmm. and I love that golf course. And not to throw out another Hogan story, but um, mid-August after the USGA Junior and, and the City Junior in '68, uh, I was out at Shady Oaks working, and he was on the putting green putting, mm -hmm. or, or on the back of two green practice in his putting, and he comes in mid-August, and it's hotter, and I'll get out, and. I'm sitting behind the counter on a stool and he leans up on the counter and we had a TV down here with the golf tournament on and he watched some of it. And then he turns and looks at me and goes, they still got that track up there? And I'm thinking, track, track. And then it dawned on me, around one in 18 fairways, he used to have a track that well, went right in front of one tee out in the or rough on one in front of one green, eight, in front of 18 tee. Cause they're kind of dog legs now, but back then they were parallel. And Don to me, that's what he was asking about. I mean, he just blurts this out. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, they do. And he goes, you know what they use it for? And I said, no, sir, what? He goes, buggy races. All right. And I went, buggy races? He goes, yeah. And he's talking about harness racing. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, he goes, yeah, damnedest thing you ever saw, buggy races <laughs> on a golf course. And I said, Mr. Hogan, that's best golf course I, I've ever played, and that's why that would be my second choice. Well, they choice. had that at Pinehurst as well. Yeah, and and, and, it, and the one that's in Aiken, I forget the name of it, the real old club there in Aiken, they all have affiliation with buggy racing, yeah, right. harness yeah, racing. Yeah, harness racing, yeah. and, and uh, he goes, yeah, but they shouldn't, I, I said, it's a great golf course. He said, yeah, but they shouldn't have a harness racing on a, or buggy racing on a golf course. Well, <laughs> you know, we're running out of time. With that, this just popped in my mind. You always hear, oh, that's a great track. Now, are they talking about a tract of land? Are they talking about, again, throwing back to harness racing? You've always heard that term. Well, you know, that's Does anybody a, really know? I, I, no. I, 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 I would always assume they're talking about the golf course. A tract of land? Uh, yeah, but maybe they're talking yeah, about okay. the, the okay. track. <laughs> yeah. Your favorite course? Mission Hills Country Club in Palm Springs. Where they had the dinosaur? Mm-hmm. Palm Springs is hard to beat, yeah, yeah. unless it's in the dead of summer. I mean, I've been out well, there and I thought, this is wonderful. Right, yeah. It You're is. looking at the mountains no matter where you look, it seems yeah. like. Yeah, we, you know, we, we played that tournament there for 50 years and uh, uh, watched, it, watched it grow, watched it mature, and it just is one of my favorites. We're out of time, but I, two things I wanted to, to, to get to real quick. You just thought of one, and... and uh, and we may run a little bit over. He won't penalize us. But uh, Dinah Shore, she was a great supporter of women's golf. Absolutely, yes. She um, was a special lady. Yeah. Yeah. She really was. And, and she really not only did a lot for the game, but she did a lot for the growth of the LPGA. Mm. Uh, she was a real catalyst with her and David Foster mm -hmm. from Colgate. I mean, mm -hmm. those two people really changed the, the path of the LPGA. I'm glad we got that in. That's good. Um, the other thing was the original or the old Austin Country Club. Mm -hmm. Is is it still there? Is there a version of it that's gone? It was a Perry Maxwell, wasn't it? I no? I, I'm not sure. I'm, We're not, I'm not yeah, sure. I I'll do some more research I don't, I don't think it's there anymore. Yeah, I, I, a few years ago, I drove out Riverside. Yeah, and it's gone. As far as I know, it's gone. Mm -hmm. I could never But that's where it. Ben grew up, right? Right. And, and I think... They had Bermuda greens there, right? Yeah, yeah. we did. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. he talked about getting the ball up on top of the grass and stuff like that. Thank you. This thank has you. been a lot of fun for me. And thank you, Paul, for making it happen. And uh, that'll do it for, uh, what is this, episode five of season three. And we'll have episode six coming up next week. Appreciate you watching. <laughs>